chapter 5. The Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Job chapter 42 verse 10. I heard your uncle Ronnie coming home from the pen today, Midnight said, as we were walking home from school that evening. Yeah, they went to pick him up this morning, I replied. My brother say your uncle Ronnie was the man around here at one time. As we talked, we continued to walk the train tracks along with several other groups of kids taking the same path as us. They said he had the whole hood on lock, Midnight added, with the hint of admiration in his voice. We got off the train tracks and were back on the main road that led to our street. During the entire walk home, I listened as Midnight talked about my Uncle Ronnie, who according to Midnight's brothers was the first person they had heard of who had become a millionaire before the age of 18, as Midnight called him. From what Midnight was saying, it seemed to me Uncle Ronnie was something like a legend in the streets, or more like a myth to the many young men and teenage boys who had heard but had never actually met him. We finally made it to 15th Court, and as soon as we walked up the block, I instantly picked Uncle Ronnie out of a crowd of seven men who would gather on Red's front porch directly across the street from our house. Other than the fact that the other six men were all gathered around him, his confident demeanor seemed to demand respect as he stood in the center of the group, puffing on a black and mild cigar. Plus, I noticed right away that he held a strong resemblance to Tez, but he was only a bit taller. Come here, youngster, Red called out to me just as I was about to approach our house. I changed directions and headed toward Red's house, with Midnight close on my heels. When I joined the group of men, which included Uncle Ronnie, Red, two of Midnight's brothers, and three other much older men who I had never seen before, I was taken aback by how much bigger Uncle Ronnie was up close. He was at least six feet nine and weighed a solid 285 pounds. He had broad shoulders, and the kind of frame that could have only come from years of lifting weights in prison. This Ted's is oldest boy, the one I've been telling you about, Red was saying to Uncle Ronnie when I walked up. This little nigga here got the heart of a lion, Red added. What's up, youngster? Ronnie said in his deep voice as he reached out and shook my hand. He stared into my eyes for a moment as if he was trying to see something much deeper that could not be seen on the surface. How old are you? He asked without ever breaking eye contact. I just turned 13, I replied. You playing the sports? Asked Ronnie. I told him that I was starting point guard of our school's basketball team and was planning to go to the NBA one day. <laughs> that brought a slight smile to his face as he looked at Red and commented. Straight from middle school to the NBA, Ronnie laughed again, and this time the other men joined in. My young mind did not know if I should be offended or just laugh myself, so I just silently stared back at him with a serious look on my face. So, who is this, he asked, switching his attention to Midnight, who had been silently standing beside me the whole time looking at Uncle Ronnie with something like hero worship in his eyes. That's my little brother, said Ken, Midnight's older brother. You play ball too? Uncle Ronnie asked Midnight. Nah, I don't play ball, I just ball, replied Midnight in a tone that suggested that he was sure of himself. Yeah, he be balling at my expense, Ken added, which got him as much laughter as I got. <laughs> I told him, these little niggas growing up too fast now, said Red, as he went into his pocket and pulled out a pack of Newports and shook one from the pack. Just like that little crazy nigga across the street, come over here a little while ago, asking me if he can borrow a gun. Who you talking about, Blinky? 
asked Midnight as his facial expression changed quickly. I guess that's what y'all call them red answer. I'll be back, said Midnight as he hurried off the porch and took off across the street. I took off behind him just as Red was about to make another comment. Them little niggas want to be gangsters so bad. Ain't no telling what they up to. His last sentence came out slurred, indicating that he had one too many drinks. We made it across the street and knocked on the front door of the old rundown house that Blinky lived in with his mother, who was hardly ever home. It wasn't even a full minute before Blinky came to the door and let us in. What's going on? Asked Midnight as we followed Blinky into the house. I heard you had some kind of run in with them Smithfield niggas. It ain't nothing I can't handle, Blinky replied. As he talked, his left eye began to twitch and blink involuntarily. Blinky had nerve damage in his left eye from where he'd been shot accidentally in the eye with a BB gun at the age of seven. The injury caused permanent damage to his left eye that caused it to sporadically blink, which is how he got the name Blinky. Ironically, it had been Midnight who had nearly shot the boy out one day as they played with a BB gun. The two of them had been friends a long time, and about a year after the incident, Midnight began calling him Blinky, and the name stuck. But the only thing odd about him was the ever-twitching eye. But aside from that, he was cool to be around and seemed to have a never-ending loyalty to Midnight and vice versa. We followed Blinky to his bedroom as he told us about the incident at school earlier. He said it started when two 8th graders were arguing in the line in the cafeteria and one of them bumped into Blinky roughly, almost knocking him down. Though he may have seemed odd or even weird to some other students as they often tease him, Blinky was by no means one to be pushed around. His imperfections put him at a disadvantage among most of his peers and he went about as if he had a point to prove. And the fact that he sometimes stuttered more so when he was upset didn't help matters any. So as me and Midnight maneuvered around the dirty clothes scattered through our Blinky's bedroom, he continued telling us what happened. As soon as he finished eating, Blinky left the cafeteria and stopped to use the restroom before heading to his next class. He quickly relieved himself and when he exited the stall, he realized he was not alone. The same two boys who had been arguing and horse playing in the line just moments ago had joined him and were both staring at him as if they were contemplating his fate. But Blinker was ready and willing to stand his ground with both of them, win or lose, if that's what it came to. But as the two boys moved closer to Blinker, he began preparing himself to go into attack mode. But that was when one of the boys lifted his shirt of allowing Blinky to see the butt of the 38 revolver he had concealed. You don't want none of this little man, said the boy as his hand rested on the gun. Take your little punk ass to class, said the other boy as they both left the bathroom laughing. He may have been seen as weird by others, but he was far from a fool. But I got something for their ass now, Blinky said, as he lifted his mattress and retrieved a black revolver. Where you get this from, Midnight asked excitedly, as he snatched the gun from Blinky's hand. Holding the gun in his left hand, Midnight began to just stare at the gun like he was mesmerized by the sheer power of the piece of steel he now held in his hand. My mama boyfriend left it, Blinky replied, as he took the gun back from Midnight. I gotta get me one of these, said Midnight, who was sitting like a kid who had just gotten a new toy to play with. But this was one toy that was capable of causing a whole lot of damage in the wrong hands. And right now, it was definitely in the wrong hands. So later that night, we all sat down to a big dinner that Mariah had cooked, especially for Uncle Ronnie. At his request, she prepared steak, baked potatoes, and salad, 
and a cream and cheese cake that she added to the menu herself. She was meeting her brother-in-law for the first time and wanted to make a good first impression. And judging by the way, Uncle Ronnie had completely devoured everything on his plate so quickly, Mariah had assumed the impression had been good. Uncle Ronnie was the first to finish eating as he had dug into his plate like he was afraid it would run away. I had no idea at the time that it was a habit he had developed in prison, being forced to eat, chew, and swallow his whole meal in under five minutes time. Once everyone was done eating, Mariah began to clean the table while ordering me and Junior to do the dishes. But I didn't complain because I knew it was her way of giving Tez and his brother some time alone to talk. So what's your plan, bro? Tez asked his brother once they were alone in the dining room. I'm going to start me a business. Let it keep on building until I get me an empire, Ronnie replied with conviction. And how you plan to get the money to start this business, Tez inquired as he fixed his big brother with the look that said, you know I know you. I got about a half a meal stash, Ronnie replied. So I'm going to use that to get started. Money, that's the least of my concern, little bro. So what kind of business? Tennis had started a business of his own a few years ago and was doing well. He didn't know a whole lot about business outside of his own, but he was willing to assist his brother in any way he could. I got a license in barber, so I may open up a barber shop, but I ain't decided yet. Though running, I already knew exactly what he planned to invest in. He chose not to discuss it with his brother while his family was around. In fact, there was a good chance that he would not discuss it with him at all. But now that they were alone, Ted's figure now was as good a time as any to broach the subject with his brother that had been eating at him for years. Ever since their mother had passed away a few years ago, Ted's had secretly blamed Ronnie for letting her take the fall and go to prison for a bunch of guns and drugs that he knew belonged to Ronnie. This had eaten at Ted's for a long time, and his resentment had continued to grow. He'd go visit their mother and walk away heartbroken from seeing her waste away in the women's federal prison. Then he would visit his brother and walk away with mixed feelings at the end of the visit. There was no doubt that Ted loved his big brother, who had been the only family he had left. Being the God-fearing man he was, Ted prayed continuously, asking God for guidance. And then one Sunday, after delivering one of his most powerful sermons, the pastor stopped Ted as he was leaving the church. So, Martez, how was your mom and brother holding up? Asked Reverend Peterson, who had been the pastor of Sardis Baptist Church since Ted was a child attending the church with his aunt. Mom been kind of sick lately, Tez informed him. And running, he's still running. Reverend Peterson placed a hand on the younger man's shoulder and looked him in the eye before saying, The Lord put it on my heart to tell you that life is too short. So whatever you do, be sure to love your family while you still can. And cast aside any difference that may be standing in the way of that love. The pastor's statement hit so close to home that Ted found himself following him into his personal office where he had let out all his feelings. He held nothing back as he expressed how he had been feeling for so long. I think when your brother comes home, the two of you should sit and face the issues head on. Talk about it and let God do the rest. That had been Reverend Peterson's advice. And now, as Ted sat at the table with his brother, he figured the sooner the better. I need to ask you a question, Ronnie, said Ted, as he fixed his brother with a serious look. I always wonder why you let mom take the fall like that. All I can tell you, bro, is that things just happen so fast. 
Running went on to tell his little brother, who had fortunately spent that weekend with their aunt and had been out of harm's way, all the things about that night that he had never been told. Details that had been forever branded in his memory. I gone to take care of some business for mom early that night. And when I returned to the house a couple hours later, the whole street was blocked with cops and rescue workers. Randy felt in his heart long ago that his little brother blamed him for their mother going to prison. And in a way, it was his fault. Either way, he knew it was only right that he told his brother the whole story. I had to leave my car down the street and walk the rest of the way to the house. At that point, Ronnie's face and voice was absent of his usual confidence, and he was replaced with a sadness that could not be imitated. Jermaine's body was still laying in the front yard, and just as I walked up, Mom was being escorted out of the house in handcuffs by four officers. So for a brief moment, Ronnie had been frozen with shock as his eyes went from his big brother laying dead in their front yard and then to his mother in handcuffs. As she got closer, their eyes met. And in that moment of no words, a message was conveyed between mother and son. The look his mother had given him as they placed her in the back of a car had told him with no doubt as to what was expected of him. As a rule, their family didn't cooperate with the law under no circumstances. And the Queen Bee had just given her son the green light to handle their own problems. The sad truth was that Mama was just as gangster as her sons. And from the day she chose this lifestyle, she knew it would come one day that she would end up in the back of a police car. Or even worse, in the back of a hearse. After being questioned by the detectives for an hour and a half, Ronald was told he was free to go, but not to go into the house, which was okay with him because at that moment, he had one destination in mind. His brother had been killed by a bullet that was no doubt meant for running, and he knew exactly who was behind it. Murder was the only thought on his mind as he brought his car to a stop in front of a house in North Birmingham where he knew he would find AJ who had once been a runner for running. When it was discovered that AJ was stealing from running, he sent a couple of workers to give AJ a message. AJ wasn't home and the two teenagers running sent had taken it upon themselves to assault the man's girlfriend when she answered the door and informed them that AJ was not home. But what's crazy, Ronnie said, is that I didn't even kill the nigga. He was telling his brother Ted that he continued to explain what happened on that night. He continued to explain to Ted that when he got there, he found the back door of AJ's house unlocked. And without thinking twice, he eased inside, his gun in hand, and made his way toward the bathroom where the sound of running water could be heard. Easing the bathroom door open, running tiptoed inside, only to find AJ slumped over in the shower with the water still running. He got out of there as fast as he could. The next day, running was picked up at his girlfriend's house and charged with AJ's murder. His fingerprints placed him at the scene, and the fact that AJ had become a suspect in his brother's murder was enough for a motive. So you know, I did 22 years in prison because I couldn't find the nerve to tell mama that I had failed and that somebody else had beat me to it. But what Ronnie did not mention was that he was almost certain he knew who would take AJ out. And it was the truth he would take to the grave. I want to show you something Ronnie said as he got up and quickly left the room. When he returned just seconds later, he had an envelope in his hand. This is the last letter that mom wrote me before she passed. He held the envelope out to his brother, who at first just stared at it. Read it, running urged, as Ted finally took the letter. For a moment, Ted just stared at the piece of paper in his hand. 
His eyes rested on the date at the top of the page. June 24, 1985. Less than a month before she died. She had only a year and a half left on her 20 year sentence. But she didn't live long enough to regain her freedom. Chantella Austin had died alone. Locked away for a crime committed by her oldest son. And never getting the opportunity to see what had become of her youngest. A single tear made its way down his face as Tez began to read his mother's last words to his brother. He sat quietly and read the letter, which was quite similar to the one she had written to him on that same day. So with her last bit of strength, their mother had reached out to them both with the same wish. All she wanted was for her son to do whatever it took to strengthen their bond. And she asked them to let nothing and nobody come between them and to always be there for each other. So as Ted finished reading, he looked across at his brother who had been studying him the entire time. I'm glad we had this talk, Ted said to his brother, feeling as if a huge burden had just been lifted from his shoulders. If there's anything I can do to help you get started, just let me know, he said sincerely. You helped out enough when you got my house back, Ronnie replied. After their mother was convicted of drug trafficking, the house had been confiscated by the feds. It was eventually sold, and Ronnie had stressed to his brother from day one to do what he could to get the family house back. The opportunity arose years later when the house was foreclosed and soon thereafter put on the market. It nearly broke Tez and created strife in his marriage, but he still managed to secure a deal on the house that held so many memories, both good and bad. But Tez really had no idea just how much he had helped his brother, who had over a half a million dollars stashed in the wall in the basement of the house. And with that money, Runner was planning to build an empire, and the money he once made in the streets was nothing compared to the numbers he was already calculating in his mind.